Uh, Dan, can you confirm it's working? Yes, it's it's live now. All right, great. So welcome everyone to the uh, week number 11 in seminar computer architecture. Today we will have two interesting talks. Uh, um, so we will start with the first one with Costa and the main mentor is Jisung. So please Jisung, go ahead, introduce the student. Okay, thank you. So hello everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Francois Costa, the first presenter of today's session. Francois is a second year undergraduate student in the Department of the Computer Science and at ETH Zurich. So he will uh, present a paper published in 1999, uh, which introduced a high-end uh, out of order and super processor at the time. I hope everyone enjoys the presentation. Okay, Costa, you can go on. Okay, right. thank you, Jason, for, for the introduction. So we can start directly with my presentation. Today, we will sp speak about the Alpha 21264 microprocessor, which is a, which is an out of order um, processor. And let's start directly with the executive summary. So the goal, of course, of each processor is to design a processor that is able to run intensive application like database, real-time real visual computing and everything. So it should be as, uh, as fast as possible. This is the general goal, but the program on the task, it was that the current processor executes instructions sequentially. So basically you take one instruction, you fetch it, you execute it, you do all the stuff. And then when you're done, you fetch the second one and so, but there is a, a problem with limited parallelism. And with pipeline processor also, a branch are problematic because you don't know if, you, if the branch is taken or not. So you cannot fetch basically. And the only solution that you have is that you, you can predict it. So the idea to deal with this problem is to reorder the instructions so you can increase the implicit parallelism between the instructions so you can execute independent instruction together. And we can also predict when the data is not available or when the result of a computation is not available. So for example, if you should take or not take a branch, we can, we can predict it. And if it's wrong, then we restore the state and we restart again. So let's start with an overview of the, the processor. So the Alpha 21264 microprocessor has a seven stages pipeline. Here you can see, this is the, this is the, the big overview of the processor with the, the six, the, with the seven stage of the pipeline. So we can directly move to the first stage of the pipeline, which is the, the fetch engine. So as we can see here, we have the fetch engine of the pipeline with a branch predictor, the line set prediction. We will talk about this later, the instruction cache, of course, and here you can see um, a, sh a shame of the, the processor where with all the components. So of course the fetch engine in the instruction fetch part and another important feature for the fetch engine is the instruction cache that is here in the processor. So this is the first part. Then the second stage of the processor, the processor just basically split int and float the point, floating point operations. It's not a very important stage of the pipeline, but it's just that it splits the operation into two different, uh, I can say cluster maybe. Then the third uh, stage of the pipeline, which is a very important feature of this microprocessor is the rename engine. So basically we just, um, the processor will rename the, um, the engine to delete some dependencies that are not necessary. Then the part involved with this one is the float map and queue for the floating point operation and the integer mapper for the int operation. Then the next part is the issue queue. So here, again, the most important thing is the float map and queue for the floating point operation and the integer queue for the integer instruction. So here, basically, this part just to put the integer instruction in a queue and wait. And then there is the register read part, which is basically load the value from the register. And again, the important part are the float map and queue register for the floating point operation and the integer queue for the integer operation. Then after this, there is the classical uh, classic execute uh, stage where the instructions are executed. And this time it's a bit different. So the floating point instruction are executed in the floating point unit and the integer instruction are executed in the cluster one and the cluster zero of the integer units. So as we can see, we have a special design for the integer instruction. We have two kinds of cluster, and we will see why later the pro and cons of this approach. And the last stage, last stage is of course memory, which is a bit more complex in this case, in the bit, bit more space from the processor. 
There is, of course, the memory controller, there's the data and control bus, the data cache, of course, the PU, which is uh, stand for PUS interface unit, and also a last part of the memory controller. So this is the last stage of the pipeline, basically, where we load all the, the value that are necessary. We will see the, we will see all the, the features in the, in the next slide and all the important stuff. So basically, for the processor, now we can move to the mechanism and the important feature of the Alpha 21264 microprocessor. So the two main features of this microprocessor are the two main features of this microprocessor are out of order execution and speculative execution. But there are also some um, features that are inter that are good that are important as well, but not as important as the two first. So we will start. I will start with the out of order execution. Then I will present the speculative execution in the processor, and then we will have a look at the last feature, which are also important in this processor. So let's move to the out of order execution. So what is the general idea of out of order execution? The idea is to reorder the instruction to increase parallelism. So assume here we have a microprocessor that can execute um, two int, um, integer instruction per second. So here we can see we have three instruction. The problem is that we cannot execute the first and the second together. Why? Because if we have a look, the first and the second have a dependency. So basically, you need to execute the first, get the value of R1, and then you have the value of R1. With the value of R4, you can get the value of R3. However, the first and the third instruction are completely independent. So what you can do, we can just reorder the second and the third. And then in the first, um, in the first cycle, we can execute the first instruction and the, the third instruction. And then in the second cycle, we can execute the second instruction. So just by reordering the instruction, we win one cycle, which is a small improvement. But this is the general idea of out of order execution. So now let's move to the out of execution and I can maybe pipeline of the processor. So here in the processor, the out of order engine is working like that. The instruction just come. Then the instruction gets renamed. Then the instruction is put in the out of order issue queue. Then the instruction goes in the execution engine. When the instruction is gone, then there is a retirement mechanism that we will see later. And then it's OK, everything is done, and the processor can, uh, can move to the, the next uh, instruction. So this is um, for the out of order execution overview. And now we will go through all, um, all feature of uh, the out of order execution um, mechanism for this processor. So let's move to the first part, which, which is register renaming. So the basic idea of register renaming is to eliminate write after write and write after read dependencies because they are not uh, important dependency. We can, just, um, we can just kick them, and it's not a problem. But there is one dependencies, uh, dependency which is very important, which is the read after write dependency. So we need to keep this dependency. So basically, the re register renaming assign a, a unique register for each um, instruction and delete these two first uh, useless uh, dependencies. And so in the processor, we have 31 uh, floating point and integer register, which are visible from the programmer. And there are also 41 float and integer register, which are completely invisible to the programmer that I use to restore the art architectural state in case of a misprediction or an error in the pipeline. So basically, the programmer doesn't does see nothing. Um, of this register renaming stage. This is completely um, invisible to the programmer. And all the next stage will work with the new register. So yes, it's a very important feature that it's completely invisible. And the programmer can do nothing about this. And of course, if there is an error, as I said, we can just restore the architectural st start and state as before. So let's move now to the second part, which is the out of order issue queue. So basically, the there are two lists of separate um, floating point and integer instruction. As I said before, the floating point instruction and integer instruction are executed separately. And the processor can issue up to four integer instruction per cycle and two floating point instruction per cycle. And one other important thing is that the processor issue always the oldest um, operation, which is obvious because it, uh, it allows to execute less speculative instructions. So, we don't want to execute um, instructions that are specula speculative instructions. If maybe they are wrong when we have non-speculative execution in the processor. So this is an important feature. And of course, to maintain the statue of each uh, register, there is a scoreboard. 
and a queue logic select um, each available instruction per cycle. So basically, the queue, the queue logics uh, check the instruction when they're ready, then they can go to the execution engine. Then the next part of the auto folder processor is the execution engine, which is the, maybe the most important part. So as I said before, we can see here, we have six, um, six execution engine. We have the first with floating point multiply. Then we have 70, 72 register, floating point add, floating point divide, floating point square root. So here we have two execution engine for the floating point instruction. And we have four execution engine for the integer uh, instruction. So as you can see, there are two clusters. As I said, they use a clustered design. So this design makes uh, everything simpler, but there is one cycle overhead if you need to send some data from the first cluster to the second or from the second cluster to the first one. And yes, this is um, a small hover overhead. However, it's not a big issue since the critical path computation will be often on the same cluster. So it's not a, it's not a very important issue, this one cycle latency. And also this new design allow a new motion video instruction, which uh, is maybe a, a strange name, but it's just a SCMD single instruction, multiple data. Um, instruction like we can have for I don't know SS6 uh, S uh, I don't remember the name but AVX industry with x86 architecture so yes they're just um, SCMD new new SCMD instruction which are good for a lot of uh, image processing application for example and so this is an overview of the execution engine and as you see there are more than 41 um, int uh, if floating point int and floating point register so these registers are not the same from the last slide here, if you are, or from the from this slide, because these are here to restore the architectural state in case of an error, and these registers are here to as to store the the instruction from the auto folder engine. Then there is the instruction retire and exception handling mechanism. So basically the mechanism, so instruction are issued out of order, but of course they retire in order, which is, of, which is uh, important for the programmer. And how they are retired, it's like for the, it's a retire like in a in-fly windows for like in the TCP protocol. So we should provide an example how this uh, mechanism work. And one other very important feature that is that when an instruction retire, then this is not speculative. So if the instruction retired, then there are no exception before with the, I don't know what previous um, previous instruction. So when, it, when it's retired, it's completely safe and deterministic, if I can say like that. And some uh, characteristic of this um, mechanism for the auto for the engine is that we can have up to 80 in-flight instruction, which is a lot. So the in-flight windows is very, very, very big. And there are also 32 in-flight load and 32 in-flight store. And the minimum uh, latency for an integer instruction is four cycles. For a memory, um, memory access is seven cycles. For a floating point um, instruction is eight cycles. And for a branch or a subroutine call, it's seven cycles. And the processor can retire up to 11 instructions per cycle. So now let's have a look for the sliding window protocol, how it exactly works. Here, assume this part here is the next instruction that we need to that we need to retire and then here are the next instruction so assume first that we get the second instruction oh do you have a okay no i think there is no question i got just a small uh, beep but i don't know what it is exactly so here we have the second instruction but we don't have the left so we cannot retire this instruction right now now we get another instruction here so we again we cannot retire no we can retire no instruction then we get here the first instruction so we can retire now this one and this one because they are safe and they generate no exception so we can just move the sliding uh, window the sliding window so these two these two instruction retire successfully for the programmer and you can see now the, the effect of these two instructions so now again we get some instruction we cannot retire then we get some instruction and we cannot retire then we get some instruction and again it's impossible to retire and in this case here, we can retire now because we get this instruction and so and so on. And then we can retire the five instruction and so on. And this is the mechanism of the sliding window protocol, which is implemented in this processor. So this is everything for the auto further execution. So I don't know uh, if someone has a question regarding this feature. 
uh, if it's not the case, then I can move directly to the speculative execution. Um, is there a question in the chat or not? Jisung, can you maybe uh, say to me? I cannot see the chat. OK. Um, OK, I think there are no questions. Yes, no questions so far. OK, perfect. So I can move to the speculative execution. So an overview of the speculative execution is like that. Here we have a processor that, as you execute this first instruction, then we have the second instruction. So we can assume that it's a, a pipeline processor. Then we get this instruction, and we check if database username is equal password. But we cannot re we, we don't have the result right now because it's a pipeline design, and we don't know what should we do. Should we uh, assume this branch is taken and do something, or assume this branch is not taken and do something else? So this is a important question, and we have two possibilities. So we can just wait, but we lose time, or we can try to predict, and if it's wrong, then we'll restore the architectural state. And the idea of speculative execution is to predict, and if it's wrong, then restore the architectural state. So the processor maybe can assume that uh, this branch will be taken and will try to take the, and will execute the next instruction. And of course, one, one missed prediction costs um, a small penalty. And in the case of our processor, it's seven cycles. So this is a lot for the processor. So the processor need a very good uh, branch prediction algorithm. And we will see uh, what kind of algorithm is implemented for this processor. So let's have a look now at the branch prediction algorithm. So here, the branch prediction algorithm has two important features, which is a pattern style prediction. And there is an arbitrary between a local predictor and the global predictor. So basically, the processor has a local predictor and a global predictor. The local predictor just take a, a pattern history of the, of the branch, of the last uh, branch, um, branch direction. And global hist history is for all the branches. And the pattern, um, pattern style is just we, we, we have a, a history for each branch with taken, not taken, 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 not taken, or something like that. And we try to map to find our history for the branch. If we find um, an history that map, we check if, if for this history, the processor will take or not take the instruction. And the mechanism here of the arbiter is just that it takes um, a decision. Should I, uh, should I trust uh, the local predictor or the global predictor for uh, the particular branch that I'm trying to predict. Because sometimes the local predictor does better, and sometimes the global predictor does better. So let's have a look um, at the patterns type branch predictor. So here, assume we have some pattern with the previous history of the branches. So for example, if we take the first one, we have taken, taken, taken. So basically, the processor always take the, this branch was always taken. So maybe the processor can predict that for this case, the branch will be taken in the, in the next time. And if we take the last one, for example, we are not taken, not taken, not taken, and it's never taken. So the processor can maybe assume that the instruction will be not taken in the next cycle. Or for example, I don't know if I take the third one with not taken, taken, not taken, taken, and so on. The processor in this case, in this case could predict that the next branch will not be taken and will, try, will not take the branch. So this is the example of pattern style branch predictor. And we will see now an example where a local predictor is a good predictor. So here, if we take this example with this branch, assuming that the condition has no side effect in the variable E, then we see that if it was taken during the last cycle, then it will be not taken. And if it was taken during, uh, during the, if it was not taken during the last cycle, then it will be taken. So basically, we can predict the outcome of the branch having the, the local history of the branch. So in this case, a local predictor is very good. And now we will move to another example. So here, assume we have a small lottery game with a E that is generated with a random, random function. So here, assume in this case that um, we know that the first branch, E modulo 4 equal, equal 0 and E modulo 3 equal, equal 0, that these two branches are taken. So in this case, we can predict. Um, we can predict using simple number theory that the third branch will be taken. And if one of the two first branches will not be taken, then again, with simple uh, number theory knowledge, we can predict that the third one will, will not be taken. And this is, this is an example where a um, global predictor is very good, because you take, the, you take the global history of the branches, and you can, um, you can take conclude, you can, 
you can say then if the you can determine deterministically say if the branch will be taken or not. So in this case, a global predictor is good. Then we will see a, another example. Here again, we have a small lottery game. And in this example, an arbiter is very good because we know that for the for the if credit equal equal zero, then in this case the local predictor is very good. But for the third branch, the global predictor is good. So here an import an arbiter is an important feature because it can say for each branches if I should if you should take the global predictor or the local predictor. And how does the arbiter do this? It's not um, written in the paper. And since it's a paper that comes from the industry, they probably don't want to share all the all the secrets. So we don't we have no information about this. So now let's move to um to another important feature, which is the line and wave prediction. So the alpha micro 21264 has a different cache architecture than the previous version of the processor, which is the alpha 21164. And this cache is a 64 kilobyte two-way set associative cache instead of an eight kilobyte a direct mapped cache. So this is better because it has better hit rate, but there are some bottlenecks because you have two lines basically in the cache and you need to wait, I think, a bit more, something like maybe one cycle to get the to get them to 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 check which uh, which line has the the value of the cache. So basically, it's a small overhead, but we can here in this case use speculative execution. So the processor just try to predict uh, which is the next uh, line of the of the cache, and then it check in parallel if it's correct or not. And one misprediction costs one cycle, but there is a very good accuracy. So definitely, this is a good algorithm. This is a good predictor for the processor. So now we have the two most important um, um, speculative feature. So the two most imp important engine for the speculation, uh, speculative execution. And I will show you how this is implemented in the fetch engine. So here, as we can see in the fetch engine, there is a branch predictor and the line set predictor, which are the two most important things. So let's have a look. So the processor can fetch up to four instructions per cycle. Which is not more than the previous version of the Alpha 21, which are of the Alpha 21164 microprocessor, but with all the improvements, then the processor goes a lot faster. And so, yeah, there are two things that are important. So there are the branch predictions. So basically, we need to we need to know which um, if there is a branch, if we should take it or not to fetch the correct instruction. So this is the first part, and it's done with branch prediction. And there is the line prediction. So as you see, the, as you know, the Data is stored in, um, in the data cache for the instru data instruction cache. So we need to predict in which line the, the instruction is. And this is exactly the problem here. We have the two line and which line should we choose for the next instruction to fetch. And yes, this is the problem. And this is done by line prediction. And so now let's, let's see another mechanism, which is the speculative load. So basically, the load come in the engine in order and the instruction retire in order. This is clear. But load and store can be reordered inside of the execution engine. And But there is a problem when we do this. And all the store after a younger load can appear. We will see why in the next slide. So we need a squash mechanism. And if it's happened, then we squash the processor and restart the pipeline. And we have also a speculatively bypass of an older store into a younger load, assuming that the older store will be executed before the younger load. And for the cache miss and everything, there is an eight entry miss address file that tracks and forward the miss to the BIS interface unit. And we will see uh, what is the BIS interface unit in the last slide. So let's have a look with uh, load and store. So of course, the goal is to load and store data as early as possible. But the read and after write dependencies are hard to handle. And so the solution, as I said before, is to train the mechanism. Again, here we can trade the mechanism to know if we should reorder and have a safer sh schedule or if we can try to predict. So one example of read after write dependency, which is hard to handle, assume here we have the pseudocode with an array, which is initialized to 0. And then we have a random variable between 0 and 99, which is a random value. And then we have a variable, each variable array 1. But we cannot, we cannot, make we cannot be sure. To have um, to have zero or I don't know any value in array one before executed this instruction. But the problem is that this instruction is random. So basically, we need to wait for this instruction. But let's assume we want to do it before, so we can maybe reorder the instruction. And then, if the random zero ninety nine becomes one, then we just squash the mechanism and restart. 
So this is the problem. And of course, in some workloads, uh, uh, reordering is not always worse. So the processor can just decide to have a safer sh schedule. And again, how it is implemented, we have no idea. They don't say it in the paper. So this is the load and store mechanism. And now we will see the last uh, feature for the speculative execution, which is a cache feed speculation. So basically, the, the processor will want to have a three, size, three cycle load integer latency in the best case. But we don't even we don't know at the beginning if the data is in the cache. We always need to check. And so the what does the processor is that it's assumed that the data is always in the cache in the cache. So just get the value. And if the data is in the cache, then you continue normally. You get, of course, some uh, it gets it got a bit faster. And if it's not the case and the data is not in the cache, then you do a small, a simple mini restart with a two-cycle latency penalty. And again, this mechanism is not um, the best for all the application. For application with very good locality, I don't know, with huge array, then it's a very good thing. But application with um, with bad array, with a poor locality, then it's not a good mechanism. So the processor can decide not to use this feature, to, um, such that it doesn't lose the time for bad uh, bad uh, bad application, for example. So this is the last important mechanism for speculative execution. And now we will move to three minor um, feature. The first is prefetching. So the goal of prefetching is to allow the programmer to take full benefit of the cache management and high bandwidth capacity. And it's very good for benchmark with huge high rate. So basically, the idea is that you we put a block of um, data into the cache before executing them, such that we win uh, we win time and we don't have to to um, to get the data from the cache during the uh, load or store instruction. And this is done via ISA instruction. So it's basically um, to do with the software. So the next important feature is the internal memory system. So this system has a very important feature, can execute up to two load and uh, store and two load and store per cycle because the, the clock is two times faster than the, the clock of the processor. And as I said before, there are 32 in flight load um, and store plus eight in flight cache misses. And there are also a better cache, not also for the instruction um, cache, but also for the data cache. And this is very good because load and store can exploit the out of order paradigm. And now let's move to the last part, which is the bus interface unit, which is the connection between the internal memory system, the L2 cache, and the rest of the system, so the ultra L3 cache. And so it takes the misaddress uh, file um, as input and it forwards the victim data. The name victim data is the L3 cache. Um, L3 cache data, so they name it in the paper like that, or the data from the main memory, and they send this data to the L2 cache, and also they send the data from the L2 cache to the L3 cache and the main system. And the role of the bus interface unit is also to maintain the cache current, and it needs to say 12 cycle latency for L2 cache access, and the bandwidth capacity is very high with 1.3 gigabyte per second, which is really a lot. So we move to the key result of the processor. So this is a quote from the paper with more functional unit and this dynamic execution technique, the processor is 50% to 200% faster than its previous processor, processor, even though both generation can fetch at more for instruction per cycle. So yes, just uh, the fact using out of order execution, speculative execution, we can win a lot of time. So these, the, these features are definitely good for the processor. So for the summary, so the auto further instruction can increase the amount of parallelism. We use a modern bridge predictor to go even faster in the, in the prediction. And we have a lot of new prediction techniques like branch prediction, line prediction, prefetching, cache hit mechanism, which are all speculatively speculative mechanism, but give at the end very good uh, result. And of course, the cache is better and the load, uh, there are high throughput and low latency um, load for the for data. So this is for the summary. Now we can move to the strength of the paper. So clearly the, the execution time is faster. It can exploit um, implicit parallelism and can run intensive workload like a real-time visual computing app database and so on. And so again, there are two quotes from the, the paper, a unique combination of high clock speed and advanced microarchitectural technique, including many forms of, of out of order and speculative execution provide exceptional core computational performance in the 21264 alpha microprocessor a database with real-time visual computing, data meaning, medical imaging, scientific technical, and so on. 
can it use the uh, outstanding performance available with the Alpha 21264 microprocessor? So these are the strengths of the paper. And now we will move to the weaknesses. Of course, all these two techniques have a space and the cost overhead. This is clear. So I think this is the, the first weaknesses. It should take a bit more space or cost a bit more. Then the second weakness is for me, which is also a very important weakness, is that it's a market, marketing paper. I write like that. It's so and come from the industry. They say that the, the processor is just the best of the world, that everything is that everything is fine, that this processor has a outstanding performance. And I think if you read the paper, we don't even need a GPU to, to do special instruction, I think, because they say that this processor can do everything, but there are no proof. They just state, okay, is we can do everything, but there are no proof on the paper. So okay, we I think we need to trust them, or yes. So yes, this is a bit of marketing paper for me. And this is a, the, a very important weaknesses of the paper. And also, it could have bad performance on very special workload with poor locality, where everything is hard to predict. This is also a small weakness. And another weakness of the paper is that it uses a lot of new technique, and they could have some issues that are unknown. And we, dis um, we discovered spaters later, the, for example, the spec attack, which is a kind of hardware attack within the, the first week of the seminar. So this technique where we're new at the beginning and nobody knew the spectral attack, for example. So this was the weaknesses. So let's move now to the takeaway. So out of order execution and branch prediction can speed up a lot of application. And we see this in the performance of the alpha to one. We see that's better than the alpha to one, one six four processor. And all these mechanisms are invisible to the, to the programmer. And these are high bandwidth and low latency data access. So these are the takeaway. And now we can move to the open discussion. So I don't know if I can see the, the chat. So here, as we can see, we have, um, OK, I can find the chat. Um, here, OK, just maybe I can answer to one the question before. I won't believe the marketing claim until I see one of the playing Minecraft at 60 FPS on maximum setting. That is a notoriously badly optimized game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, maybe, but uh, there are no um, they, there are no proof with some benchmark or something like that. So maybe we can move to the first discussion. We um, <laughs> we have a lot of speculative execution. What can we do to improve the predicted rates? Do you have some idea that can be done to improve the predicted rate with this processor? Um, has someone an idea, maybe? You could mix this with the perceptron um, prediction thingy from a few weeks ago. OK, yes, this could be an idea. So the the paper was written in the year 2000, I think, or a bit later, a bit uh, before. So it's the paper is basically younger than me, uh, older than me, sorry. So yes, it was a, a lot of time before. The perception was not, a, was, not a, was not a possibility at this time. But yet, this could be a, a possibility the, to use the perceptron, maybe. Um, has someone an, another ID or something with uh, related with the perception? I don't know. Are there maybe another technique that could be used for the branch prediction mechanism? Or oh, I don't know, maybe a creative ID with a software hardware cooperation? OK, basically, no, there are no ID. Um, for example, I don't know um, if there are other techniques, maybe how they can train the arbiter as someone an ID, how to train an arbiter to give good results. Should we use maybe again a perceptron? OK, maybe there are no ID, so I can move to the, to the second question. So here may be another interesting question. What could be done in the compiler in order to help the processor? So which, uh, what, what do you have an idea of what we can do in the compiler? I don't know, for example, with a with small keyword like in Java where you, you say at override. Has someone an idea? Maybe, I don't know, you use a, a small tag to explain, to say that, that this data structure has a very good locality or Feel free to feel free to to speak. 
Okay, yes, one idea could be to, to give hint for likely branch prediction. So for example, how would you this how would you do this, Lucas? Just uh, with a, uh, do you have an, uh, how would you do this? Can you explain please, maybe? Well, um, if we have a loop, um, the branch direction that goes back into the loop would probably be more likely than the one that exits the loop. Okay, yes. And well, could be, for example, to have tag that say, okay, it's always taken or never taken, or probably taken. So some, some was me, it's um, a lot of maybe tag with different value or just a two, two tag or probably taken and not taken. What do you think, maybe? How would you implement this, Lucas? Maybe have like tags for um, likely taken, likely not taken. And um, um, something in between, like um, equal chances, roughly, or very likely taken and very likely not taken. Okay. Yes. So maybe some granularity um, for what will happen. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you for for your answer. Um, has someone an idea? As we said, as I said in the presentation, the arbiter need to be trained and. To, to know which uh, branch is better. So um, do you have an idea how you can help the arbiter to make better prediction between the local predictor and the global, predi global predictor? If you have an idea, feel free to, to write in the chat or maybe open your microphone and talk. Has someone uh, maybe an idea how we can help the arbiter? Okay, so basically label branch with which predictor were better. This is good, this is in, indeed a, a good idea. So basically for each branch, you can say if uh, it's local or if it's a local predictor or a global predictor, this could be a good idea. However, I think in the, if we need to, to code it like that, it would have a, a big overhead, but yes, it could be definitely an idea. So, I think we can move directly to the next uh, question, which is a bit more general and not only, only related with this processor. Is here, as we see, we had a lot of um, a lot of uh, mechanisms that are completely invisible to the programmer. And my question is, what do you think about all these mechanisms? Should should they be completely invisible to the programmer, or should we have some mechanism to communicate with the programmer and enable more hardware software architecture? So. What is your opinion about um, about this uh, this sentence? Feel free if you are if you have a, a comment, feel free to, to write it in the chat or open your microphone, of course. Uh, I I think that uh, I mean for us, hardware software cracks, so to speak. Uh, collaboration between software and hardware is always awesome, but yes. at the same time, if we consider the stupidest possible user, Yes. Uh, if there exists collaboration between software and hardware, uh, this user can basically uh, do much more stupid stuff than if uh, there wasn't as much collaboration between software and hardware. And uh, I mean, whatever this user does has a basical, uh, basically so to speak, uh, physical consequences and, and not only virtual ones. So uh, I, I think it's there's a slight trade-off there between uh, reliability and, and so to speak safety of uh, such a system and well, possibilities and, and freedom yes. uh, on the other side. Okay, yes, this is true. But if we, if we, if we take an example, for example, in the, in the case of our processor, the prefetching instruction are, are at ISA level. So basically it's the role of the programmer to, to prefetch the instruction. Do you think it's a, it's a good idea or it makes just the, the, the code more complex and, hard, and the programming language harder to program? So what is uh, your opinion about that? Uh, I think here uh, it's quite good because it works on a level where most people don't notice it and really don't have uh, the uh, ability to influence it. Yes. But at the same time, uh, we know that conse a, a, a consequence of prefetching 
uh, as you already mentioned in the presentation, is uh, Spectre, if yes. I remember correctly. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there we have one example where uh, a smart user, a malicious user, uh, could potentially exploit this uh, in a malicious manner. So, uh, I think, again, it, here it is mostly something that most people don't notice and it took a lot, a lot of time till we noticed Spectre, but uh, at the same time, it is a security issue. Yes, exactly. This is also the case which, uh, with uh, a trade-off between performance and security and everything like that. I agree completely with you. So we can uh, move directly to the perfect transition to the next question. So prefetching is implemented at ISA level and how a programmer should uh, deal with it. Uh, maybe a question for everybody in the chat. If you had, uh, if you have, um, I don't know, in, in C and C++ like that, you have a, a yeah, instruction to prefetch instruction. Do you think you would uh, either, would you use this instruction to prefetch all instruction or not a lot? I don't know what, uh, what are the, the opinion of the of the person in this seminar. So do you think you would use a, a prefetching ISC instruction or not a lot when you code? Maybe. I cannot see the chat anymore. So. Um, I guess I wouldn't do it every time I write a program and so on, but if I'm like, if I've, if I'm given a job and I'm told to make it as fast as possible, then yeah, I would, I would think about this possibility, but it's not like I would write every C code just like it's machine code and so on. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I thank you for the answer. Yes, I think if we use a prefetching, it makes the code everything a bit more complicated. But may, do you think with a, with a, if we implement prefetching at software level, we can get better results at, uh, at hardware level? What is your opinion about the, this, about this? Well, for sure. Uh, but it's, I think it's really specific for certain operations. Like uh, there are some applications that are like very predictable okay yes. uh, when it comes to branch prediction and you could for sure uh, profit if you could use it there but then again uh, when it's really unpredictable not much that you can do there I think yes it is true for example I know for for I don't know machine learning deep learning application with a lot of matrix multiplication I think Prefetching should be a very good, uh, a very good uh, possibility in this case. I think with prefetching, we can really improve the, improve the, the speed of some algorithm, like matrix, matrix multiplication with a high locality. And okay, so now we can move to the. Oh, just yes. just on this point, like uh, I think uh, uh, this will open also or, or like today's compilers are using this as uh, instrumenting. Um, uh, smart uh, uh, like knobs inside the compiler to to do prefetching yes and also highly optimized uh, libraries uh, for example mkl of intel will we'll use these uh, capabilities but most uh, most users that are not experts in this or professional in this uh, area will, will just write a, a simple code and uh, it's um, it, it's like that the job of the internal or it's called hardware um, hardware prefectures to, to do that so I think we need both of them like hardware prefectures which um, algorithms of AI are uh, um, implemented there and yes. also the uh, the interface to the software which is uh, mostly used by compilers and uh, highly optimized uh, libraries yes okay yes. Yes, I think it's the case that the, the prefetcher, the prefetcher could be implemented at software level and ha at hardware level. And I agree with you that the both level are important. So yes, thank you for, for your comment. And I don't know if someone wants to, to say something about this point. If it's not the case, then I can move to the last point, last point and which is more related with auto further execution. So let's move to this one. Do you think that a programmer should care about instruction reordering or not? Do you think, for I don't know, for example, that we have we should have good uh, 
instruction reordering practice or everything uh, can be done by the compiler or by the out of further um, mecha, mecha engine in the processor. What is your opinion about that? I don't know if there is a comment in the chat. Okay, nothing. Do you think that we should, for example, learn um, when we learn programming, should we learn good practice about instruction reordering and try to keep uh, independent instruction? So wasn't the original point of reordering to be hidden to the programmer? So yes, the, the idea of the instruction engine is to be, uh, the auto for the engine is to be completely hidden to the programmer. However, if we give um, instructions that are already partially ordered, I think it can help the out of further engine to, to get better results. So this is my idea. Yes, of course, everything in this processor is completely hidden to the, to the user. However, maybe if we open some of the, of the mechanism, then it, and we have more cooperation with the user, then maybe we can accelerate, uh, accelerate everything. But yes, the, the main mechanism is that it should be completely hidden to the user. Yeah, one point on this, like if, if we remember the Intel Itanium, for example, project, it was uh, uh, using a simple instruction, risk instruction, and uh, doing all the reordering in uh, the v, like VLIW instructions. And this project was not continued because uh, most of the processors today are doing out of uh, the high, uh, high performance processors are doing uh, uh, like the ordering inside, out of order execution inside the hardware itself, not in the compiler level, and okay. uh, they are they are more successful than than uh, relying on the user. Uh, in this case, um, I, but it, it comes in the um, in the expense of uh, additional energy consumption, because if you do this reordering in the compiler level, you don't have uh, much uh, energy to consume. Uh, while doing out of order execution. But one, one additional point, like most of the uh, processors today are using SMT, which is simultaneous multi-threading. So once you compile something for one core and um, you have mul multiple thread running on the same core, uh, then um, like a compiler cannot know what, what is running on the, on the other thread. So that's why uh, most mostly like today, all of the processors are, or this is one of the reasons that most of the processors are using out of order execution uh, in the hardware level because the hardware will be smarter because it's using online uh, metrics and um, events for this purpose. Okay, so your opinion is that um, that instruction reordering is better at hardware level and should be completely transparent to the, to the user. So, and as you said, maybe in the, with the, the project with Intel, it's maybe not the, the best to have it visible to your user and maybe everything should be uh, completely invisible to the user. So, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. So I think if there are no other comment, we can just uh, close this presentation and move to the next one. And thank you everybody for, for listening to this presentation. So I don't know if there is an extra question or remark. Otherwise uh, I will close it. Okay, I think it's not the, ca the case. So thank you a lot for, for reading, uh, for hearing my presentation. Okay, so thank you, Francois. So as the last uh, concluding remark, um, actually, yeah, it is, uh, in my opinion, it is quite interesting that uh, this paper published, uh, published 23 years ago, uh, introduced uh, various concepts in process design, such as uh, out of execution and speculative execution, prefetching, uh, that are widely adopted, still widely adopted and increasingly important in modern processors. And uh, as discussed for sure, there still exists a larger room for improvements um, and more tightly, as discussed, more tightly coupled hardware and soft core design and compiler supports and machine learning based prediction would work uh, for here, yeah, in my opinion. Okay, so thank you for your presentation. Thank and you. Yeah, I think we can move on to the next slide, next presentation. Okay, well, perfect. Thank you so much, Costa. That was thank you. Uh, very good. Thanks, uh, Jawad and Jisung for the comments. So do we have any question from 
the audience, I think on YouTube, we still don't see any comments. Okay. If you still have a question, then you can- uh, Oh, we got, we got two questions just now. Okay. From YouTube, yeah. let me paste them in the chat. Okay. And I will try to answer this question, of course. Prefetch, uh, probably prefetching is essential, essential for more vector machine. In software, there are too many exception cases. Talasio, must embedded engineer take care of the ordering, especially using the bar to keep the program memory access keep in sequence? Probably most embedded engineering making the firmware should know. Okay, so yes, thank you for your your message. So I think the, if your conclusion is that at the, at the, when you program at very low, low, low level, then you should uh, care about all the sync. So yes, thank you for, for your comment. Okay, so if there are no other questions, then I can close my presentation. Do you have another question on YouTube? No, not really. Okay, so I don't see anything in the chat. So thank you a lot for, for hearing my presentation and let's hear the next one right now. Thanks a lot. So we have uh, Bernard and uh, let me make you co-host. You can start sharing your screen. Okay, thank you. So the main mentor, we have Bahzad. Uh, so Bahzad, please start introducing the student whenever he is ready to share his screen. Okay, thank you, Mohammed, and welcome everyone to the second presentation of the today, today's seminar course. So I'm very happy to introduce very briefly Bernard Kronjic. He is a course year undergraduate student in, at ETH Zurich in computer science. And today he's going to talk about Mirage course paper, which it is published in Micro 2017. So this paper introduces a heterogeneous uh, in order and off tower core design cursor design. And I hope that you will enjoy the talk by Bernard. Okay, Bernard, go ahead, please, if you are ready. Okay, thank you, Bezat. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to my presentation about Mirage course, the illusion of many out of order course using in order course in order hardware. There's a typo, sorry for that. Uh, this paper was presented at the International Symposium Microarchitecture in 2017. Okay. So let's start with the ex ex executive summary. So the basic problem is there are practical and thermal constraint limits to the deployment of homogeneous multi-core systems with many big out-of-order cores. So there is a physical limit to how many chips you can put on one processor. And the low performance of in-order cores limits their widespread usage. So they are just not efficient enough. The goal is to design a heterogeneous chip multiprocessor with near out-of-order performance, while at the same time having the energy consumption of an in-order processor. And the idea is to use clusters of in-order cores around one out-of-order core. And in this setting, the out of order core is kind of like the scheduler. So it creates a plan and the in order cores are workers that can follow these plans. And the Mirage core, it can achieve on average 84% performance of a homogeneous chip while conserving 55% of energy and 25% of area costs. So let's look at some background. Uh, we heard a lot about out of order course in the last presentation. So basically, uh, let me move this. Uh, out of order course, they outperform in order course because of the additional hardware that they have. But this additional hardware results in higher power consumption. So we can see this is the overall case. So an in order core, it will achieve about 60% of the performance relative to an out of order core while only using about 20% of the, its power. And the authors in this paper, they will 
also differentiate between the HPD and LPD categories. So this stands for high performance difference and low performance difference. So basically the idea of the high performance difference categories, those are the benchmarks where the applications are better on the other four core because they can use the hardware that allows them to reorder. And the low performance difference category, this means like even though you have the additional hardware, you can't really profit off it. So the there isn't a lot of difference in performance between the out of order and in order core for these benchmarks. Then another aspect is heterogeneous computing in general. So we usually see it in some systems where there are mixed processor types. So usually there are mix of CPUs and GPUs on the same chip. So in this case, the GPU, it can do graphical operations and operations on large data sets, while the CPU can perform the other operations at the same time. And there's also built-in logic for interfacing with additional hardware. So if you have hardware components like network adapters or sound cards, you can use this additional logic to communicate faster with these components. And there are most important, there are hardware accelerators. So those are specialized hardware that can run certain operations faster than in software on a regular CPU. Okay. So the goal is to design a processor that has high throughput and single thread performance while at the same time being very energy efficient. So usually you can't have all of them but they, the authors are trying to get all of it. So let's look at the novelty, the key approach and some ideas. So the idea of heterogeneous chips, it isn't exactly new. So a very well known example is the Big Little architecture by ARM. It was released in 2011 and its design is still used in almost all smartphones and even uh, the Nintendo Switch. So it is usually used in mobile device to preserve battery life. So you can run uh, efficient tasks on the big cores and those tasks that aren't as important, you can run them on little cores to save battery life because that is limited on mobile devices. Okay, and uh, now we'll look at the difference in area for different architectures. So we have a uh, homogeneous out of order and in order chip. And basically four out of order cores, they roughly have the same area as 10 in order cores. And the problem with this is, so with the four order cores, you have a lower system throughput simply because you have less cores, but you have a shorter execution latency because of the ability to reorder instruction, which is not possible with the in order cores. So here, the Mirage core comes in. So the idea here, there is one out of order core with six in order cores and the out of order core, it creates a schedule by reordering the instructions. And all the in order cores are then able to do this uh, instruction on a similar performance level like an out of order core would do it. And this allows high system throughput because you have a lot of uh, in order processors and still short execution latency because you are able to reorder instructions. Yeah. Now this is a, a overview of the Mirage core architecture. So all of this, this is so-called cluster. Here we have the out of order core. So the out, it contains the out of order core that works as the scheduler and it has its own uh, L1 instruction cache, its schedule cache, we will see what this is later, and the L1 data cache. So the arbitrator is its hardware uh, is an hardware extension and it can see how different apps perform according to different metrics. And this is all connected with an interconnect, which goes to the shared L2 cache. And then we have the modified in order course. They also have their own L1 caches and the schedule cache. And they are able 
through these hardware changes to uh, perform uh, reordered instructions from the out of order core. Okay, let's look at some mechanisms in some detail. A uh, very important principle in this paper is the idea of memoization. Many of you should know what this is, but I'll just quickly go over it. So here's like an example. If you want to calculate the fifth Fibonacci number using recursion. So this tree shows all of the steps that you would have to calculate if you were doing it simply by recursion. And this is how it would look like if you were to use memoization. So you would store values for previously calculated steps in an array and you can reuse them so all these red parts you will not have to calculate them and the tree grows much smaller so you can imagine if let's say you have to calculate down the fibonacci number this is much more efficient and this is also the case when it comes to the schedules that are created on the out of order core so the reordering of long latency events only accounts for 19% of the performance advantage of out of order cores. So most applications, they spend most of their time in loops when you look at their machine code. And this means that scheduling usually holds the same pattern in similar context. So because programs, they are usually all the same, it is worth to remember what the program did before. So you don't have to redo the operations on the out of order core every time because that's what's expensive uh, when it comes to energy. And therefore, you can get a similar performance while saving a lot of energy. Okay. And in this graph here, we see the HPD category, of course. It has more instructions that can be memorized because they actually profit of the out of order hardware. So they can achieve a lot uh, better performance if there are less instructions memorized. So this is an important point. Okay, now the way they do it, so the applications, they are memorized on the out of order core for a fixed time interval. So you basically sample each application and you see how it does on the out of order core. And switching between the cores creates an overhead due to migrating the whole workload and also due to cold L1 cache accesses. So this graph shows us uh, the numbers if we switch after n cycles. So if you look at here, if we switch after a thousand cycles, we get a performance of a little bit more than 80%. And this is mainly due to the uh, L1 cache accesses. And if we do it like a million times, after every million cycles, we get a performance loss of only about 1%. So in this case, more switching, uh, uh, less switching, sorry, means better performance. On the other hand, if the out of work core can refresh the schedule cache every thousand cycles, a bigger fraction of the execution is memoized because it can check changes more frequently. So this number, it starts to drop between 10 and 100K and it drops quite a lot after a million. So the authors decided like here where the red line is, this is like a good point to define the interval. So they decided there is a migration every million cycles. Okay, when it comes to designing the arbitrator, there are three different types. So there is energy efficiency oriented arbitration, system throughput oriented arbitration, and fairness oriented arbitration. So in this paper, they basically use a combination of the first two and but they can choose whichever they want because they are flexible at runtime. Okay, uh, let's first look at the energy efficiency oriented arbitration. So because the out of order core execution is the most expensive, the energy efficient arbitrator, arbitrator only activates the out of order core when it is useful to memoize. So how useful it is to memoize is described by this uh, metric. It's called the schedule cache misses per kilo instruction. 
So basically it compares the cache misses on the in-order core and on the out-of-order core. And at every interval, so every million cycles, it decides if it should pick an application or if it should, if it should turn the out-of-order core off. So it basically picks the application with the highest cache misses above a certain threshold. Now let's look at some examples. So let's look at application one. So application one has a high cache misses on the in-order core, but low cache misses on the out-of-order core. So the factor on its own is high. Therefore, it is a good candidate. And if we think about it, so it has a lot of cache misses on the in-order core. That means it's not as efficient on the in-order core, but it has hardly any cache misses on the out-of-order core. So therefore, it can profit of reordering the instructions. So it's a very good candidate. Then application two, it has low cache misses on the in-order core and low cache misses on the out-of-order core. So that means that the performance is basically the same if it's on the in-order or on the out-of-order core. So there is really no point to migrate it to the out-of-order core. In this case, we would turn the out-of-order core off if there are no better candidates. And this way we can preserve energy because the performance will basically be the same. And then there's application three. It has high cache misses on the in-order core, but also high cache misses on the out-of-order core. And that's kind of the same idea again. So you would have a lot of cache misses on the out-of-order core. So even though you use the hardware for reordering, it doesn't help a lot. So you might as well not do it because it will just use more energy. Then the system throughput oriented arbitration. So here it basically checks the speed up. So it compares the instructions per cycle between the inner core and the out of order core. And at each cycle, it just takes the slowest application and speeds it up. Pretty simple. And this is the traditional design that are on most heterogeneous chips. So they don't care about energy efficiency. They just take the slowest one and speed it up. And then there's also the fairness oriented arbitration. So if it was completely fair, the, it would just be in round robin order. So every application, if there are 10 applications, every application is 10% of the time on the other four core. But they're doing it a little bit different. So it's fair, but still energy efficient. So uh, there is the metric util i. So application i will be migrated only if its metric is less than one divided by the total amount of apps or if the cache misses falls below the threshold. So this ensures that no application runs more, like if we have 10 applications, no application will run for more than 10% of the time, but it will run less if it's not necessary. Okay, then when it comes to designing the core architecture, we have to design the out of order core, the modified in order course, and the migration between the cores. So, in order to memorize schedules, the out of order core must be able to recognize when the trace is repetitive and if its instructions are scheduled in the same order. So, naively, you would just compare two schedules side by side, but this is obviously very expensive. So, instead, you compare certain metrics to see if two traces are similar. And if they are similar, so if they are matching, they are stored in the schedule cache. Uh, the whole process is explained in the paper of the same authors, Dynamos it's called. Uh, I won't go too much into detail, but if someone is interested, I posted the link to the document. Okay, then for the in-order core. They introduce the O in O mode, and O in O stands for an in order core appearing to be an out of order core. So, for it to be able to run memoized code from an out of order core, it needs additional hardware. This is an, a, the ability to perform atomic execution, a physical register file, a load store queue, and the schedule cache. So, for atomic execution, so the a standard in order core, it cannot detect unexpected events like branch mispredictions or memory aliases. And 
because it doesn't track the correct program order of the memorized code. So therefore, the ONO is forced to execute the schedules atomically. And if there is a misprediction, it basically just resets the whole execution and executes it in the order, which is just non memorized So just basically normal order. Then out of work course, a uh, very important fact there is they use register renaming to eliminate false register dependencies. And this is a big boost in performance. But if you have a lot of registers renamed, the architectural register file that you have in an in-order core will, be, will not be enough. So there is an expanded physical register file. So for every architectural register, there are four, uh, four physical registers. So if you have 32, you have a 128 entry physical register file. This, of course, adds an additional 28 bytes of storage, and the tables add about 14% dynamic energy to the in-order core. Then a uh, similar reason why we need ex atomic execution. So we add a load store queue to implement, uh, to prevent memory alias errors. So this is also added like as a fixed size metadata block, and it adds about 20 bytes. And the, it contributes about 5.5% overhead to the dynamic energy of the O and O. Then finally, we have the schedule cache. So this is basically an eight kilobyte cache. It stores the memized schedules from the out of order core. And here, trace speculations are very expensive because you have to restart the whole operations and this should be avoided. So and schedule cache writes, they are expensive because the traces, they are written compactly inside the cache. So to avoid fragmentation inside of it. And they employ an algorithm that is heavily biased against traces that we speculate. And its eviction policy is first, it evicts the traces that are deemed unmemorizable. And after that, they evict the least recently used traces. And this cache, it contributes about 10% towards leakage energy, but it reduces L1 instruction cache access energy. So kind of a trade-off. And then the migration between the cores. So on migration, you must store all of the active core states, including the register file, program counter, control bits, etc., into memory and its pipelines must be flushed. Okay, now let's look at some results that we got. So first look at some methodology. So basically they have their out of order course, in order course in the memory system. Sorry. So in the in order core, it's a smaller pipeline and uh, the out of order core has an additional floating point register file. Otherwise they're basically the same. Uh, memory system, we have 32 kilobytes L1 cache for instructions and data, uh, two megabyte shared L2 cache, uh, eight gigabyte main memory, and the 32 bit L1, L2 interconnect. Uh, there are 27 applications from the SPEC 2006 benchmark suite, and there are like I said in the beginning, they are divided into the categories that are based on their IPC ratio. So we have the high performance difference categories and low performance difference categories. The GEM5 simulator is used to model the Mirage course and the MAC PET modeling framework is used to estimate area, static and dynamic energy consumption for the core and L1 caches. Okay, now they will always compare different sizes in their evaluation. So it's always two numbers. So the first number, it stands for the amount of in-order cores and the second for the number of out-of-order cores. So we have a eight zero homogeneous in-order core. It's the smallest, a zero eight homogeneous out-of-order core, which is by far the biggest. A 8.1 heterogeneous traditional core so this means we have eight in-order cores with one out-of-order core, which is kind of just a booster for the applications. 
and we have the eight one Mirage cores. So a Mirage core with one out of order core plus scheduler with uh, eight O in O cores. It's slightly bigger than the traditional heterogeneous design. Okay, now we will look at some area comparisons. So we will look at the four cores. So basically, we have uh, on the left, we have a homogeneous in order core with four cores. And simply by adding one out of order core, we get uh, about 55% area additionally. And for the Mirage core, the additional hardware that we have in the in order course adds another 23% to the area. Then let's look at some performance. So this graph on the right is the maximum system throughput. So this is the traditional design and it achieves like about 70% of uh, homogeneous out of order core for four cores. Now we compare it with the energy efficient Mirage core. And when you think about it, one is there just to maximize performance, but, and the other one is there to be energy efficient, but it is still faster than the maximum system throughput. We will see later why. And we get the fastest performance if we have a combination of both. So it is energy efficient, but still maximizing system throughput. Okay. Okay, now let's look at some energy consumption. So now we compare the energy consumption be between a traditional heterogeneous design and the Mirage course. So the difference in the energy consumption, it is due to the bigger physical register file and the load store queue in the ONOs. So yeah. And it's still like, if we look at it, it looks uh, like a lot of difference, but it's still all less than 60% of uh, homogeneous out of order course. So it is uh, an okay trait to take, I guess, because it's not that much worse. Okay, now let's look at, uh, like at the case study. So in this case study, they compare two different arbitrators. So the maximum system throughput arbitrator and the energy efficient arbitrator. So each point in this graph, it describes the speed up relative to the out of order core. And points are marked blue if they are scheduled on the out of order core and red otherwise. So we see a lot of, uh, a lot of red here and a lot of blue here. So Let's look at the first application, A star. So A star is a pathfinding algorithm and it is a low performance difference. It is chosen because it has the lowest slowdown on the in order core on the in order core and it has very high variability in its control flow. This means that it is a bad candidate for maximum system throughput as well as for the energy efficient arbitrator. Yeah. So then the next two applications, they're a bit more regular. We see that in the graphs. So the second application, HMMER, it is used to search for patterns in a DNA sequence. It has a very high slowdown on the in-order core of about 60%. So remember the maximum system throughput, it always migrates the one with the highest speed up. So Hammer is always chosen. And it's basically all the time, except that this mark of about 130 million cycles. And this is where it is uh, contested by BZIP2. Uh, BZIP2 is just a compression benchmark. And on the maximum system throughput arbitrator, it is starved of out of order time, basically because the HMMR benchmark is taken every time. Now, in contrast to the maximum system throughput arbitrator, once HMMR, uh, HMMER is memoized, it can perform consistently near out of order performance while using the out of order core way less. 
So we see that here. So like in the top graph, it's a straight blue line, but here it's only dots. So this means that once you memoize this benchmark, you can you don't have to run it on the other four core every time. So this in turn, it allows BZIP more time on the out of order core. So by reducing the performance of HMMR, we can highly boost the performance of BZIP2. And this in case gives us a bigger system throughput in total. So that's how the idea works. And otherwise we can also turn off the out of order core to conserve energy. So this is why the energy efficient arbitrator is already more efficient than the maximum system throughput one. Okay. So the hard uh, the HPD category it has a very low performance on the homogeneous in order core, obviously. Uh, but due to its regular execution structure, the HPD category on the energy efficient arbitrator is about 15% higher, as a 50% higher system throughput uh, compared to the homogeneous in order core, while using the out of order core 80% of the time. So then for the LPD category, it can't be memoized as often. So the out of order core is utilized only about 27% of the time. Therefore, the speed up on the for the LPD category is only about 10%. But compared to the HPD, it conserves a lot of energy. Then the energy efficient and the energy efficient plus maximum system throughput arbitrator, they maximize out of order core utilization for the LBD category, even though there is no significant speed up. And this means in the random category benchmarks that created out of order starva starvation due to high contention they could perform a lot better when paired with unmemizable benchmarks from the LPD. So we see that in the random category, we get the best performance. Uh, so this means the Mirage core, it performs best when there is a good mix of workloads with different requirements for the out of order core. So it's not good if all the apps require the out of order core and it's not good either when none of the apps require the other four core. So it needs a good mix. Then let's look at the arbitrator for equal resource sharing. So in the first graph, we have uh, four different arbitrators. In the first one, we have the maximum system throughput. So the authors, they chose eight apps. So we don't know which one they are. They are probably chosen in a way just to prove a point, I guess. And in this case, application seven uses like more than 60% of the out of order core. And this can be problematic in certain systems. So the energy efficient arbitrator, it reduces out of order core utilization in total. So it's only used 60% of the time, but it still favors some apps over the other. So app seven still is used most of the time. Then we have the fair arbitrator and that this is like a really fair arbitrator. So we have eight apps and every app is given exactly 12.5% utilization. But this is kind of unnecessary because energy usage is really high. We can see this in this graph. So the energy usage is really high. Well, performance is nowhere near the energy efficient fair arbitrator. Now the energy efficient fair arbitrator is make sure that no app is run more than 12.5% of the time, but it still reduces the total utilization to about 63, 64%. Okay. Now let's compare areas. So now it was always about comparing uh, the amount of course and they thought it should be good to compare area. So they have a Mirage core with an energy efficient arbitrator. So it has eight on in order cores and one out of order core compared to a traditional heterogeneous core with five in order cores and three out of order cores. 
I think the comparison is a bit questionable because if you have a five and three configuration, you might as well compare it to four and four because like usually the most, uh, most of the heterogeneous chips on the market uh, like that are based on the big little architecture. There are like four and four or eight and eight. So yeah, maybe they didn't want to compare it that way, but yeah. So we have uh, about 10% higher performance on the Mirage course while also using about 10% less energy compared to this one. But yeah, like I said, again, uh, it would be interesting co to compare it with a uh, 4.4 setting. Maybe it would be in fact different and maybe this is why they didn't show it, but I don't know. Okay. Then there is also the cost of core migration. So this shows the costs of uh, migrating the contents of the caches. We see that for the HPD category, there are a lot more migrations than for the LPD for the sake of schedule production, of course. And here we see the average overhead of 0.15% which is insignificant according to the authors. So this is a trade they are willing to take. Okay, now I'll quickly summarize the paper uh, presentation again. So yeah, problem, practical power and thermal constraints limit the deployment of homogeneous multi-core systems with many big out of order cores. So yeah, we can't put just as many cores as we want. There is a physical limit and low performance on, of in-order cores limits their widespread usage. The goal is to de design a heterogeneous chip with near out of order performance and in order energy consumption. And the idea, using clusters of in-order cores around a single out of order core, where the out of order core is used as a scheduler and the in-order cores as workers. And the Mirage cores can achieve on average 84% performance of a homogeneous chip while conserving 55% of its energy and 25% area costs. Yep. Now let's look at some strengths and weaknesses to the paper. So let's first look at the strengths. A uh, big strength, it, it's a simple idea that can achieve high system throughput and low energy consumption without having to make a heavy trade-off on single thread performance. And another point is, the scheduler is really flexible to fulfill the user's needs. Hence, it is applicable to many systems. So if you have a system that should be like really energy efficient, you can have the energy efficient arbitrator. If at some point you don't care about energy efficiency, you just need performance, then you run it on maximum system throughput. And it if it has to be fair for some reason, you make it run fair. And you can change all of that during runtime, which is very good. Uh, it tackles a very important problem in energy consumption. Like 20 years ago, like, yeah, they knew global warming was a thing, but it wasn't really a problem caused by processors and so on. But times are coming with big data centers where I really have to think about how we design those chips and what their impact actually is on the environment. And it's a well-written, easy to understand paper. So there aren't too many complex uh, concepts. Uh, well, you do need some kind of knowledge uh, beforehand, but it's not something super difficult. Okay, then the weaknesses. So the paper, it doesn't go too much into detail when it comes to multi-threaded computing, which is kind of important. Uh, it gives no programming model or example design. So basically they say, yeah, this is our design. This is the result. Uh, if you want to do it, do it yourself. They only look at CPU heterogeneity. So they are really narrowing their options there, I think. So one could use heterogeneity in general a lot more. Then servers, they cannot profit of this architecture due to more irregular fetch patterns. And I think 
like besides of uh, like mobile platform servers are like a very good candidate for energy efficient uh, processes because they are causing the problems like not home PCs, but it's like the servers. So it's kind of unlucky that it's not as efficient for servers. And another thing, it's only efficient when there is a good mix between LPD and HPD workload. So yeah, this is like ideal. Uh, you don't have this every time, so you can't choose to get a good mix between apps that are good on an out of work core and those that aren't. Or it's like really hard. What's the point? Okay. Now some thoughts and ideas. Uh, there is not much official to it yet, but Intel, they announced the Intel Core Alder Lake processor, processor. So this is the first time that a mainstream processor is uh, using the heterogeneous design. And we saw it a lot in mobile processors because, because of the energy efficiency, but Intel actually wants to release a processor this year that is heterogeneous. So what they have is eight little Graceman cores for high efficiency, eight big Golden Cove cores for high performance with multi-threading. So in total, you have 24 threads. So eight from the Graceman cores and 16 from the Golden Cove cores. They have a, their own hardware scheduler. We don't know anything about it yet. And yeah, it's to be released in 2021. And I think it's a really interesting point not too much with this paper, but just heterogeneity in general. So Intel realized like there are really some limits to how you can increase performance and energy consumption on your chips. So they're actually uh, trying something completely new for their design. Yep. And some key takeaways. So. It is a nice approach to get high system throughput, high signal thread performance, and low energy consumption at the same time. It does not require a lot of additional hardware, a lot of new additional hardware. The arbitrator design is very flexible. And there is a lot to build on with this idea. So it's like, this is not done work. You can do a lot more with it. And another takeaway is heterogeneous designs are an important tool for increased energy efficiency in the future. And we will have to think about it at one point. Maybe not today as much, but for sure in 10 years. OK, so this basically concludes my presentation. Now we will move to the open discussion. So the first discussion points. Uh, what are fields where the Mirage course can be applied? Uh, I just have a quick question, if I can ask. Yeah. Uh, when you previously say, uh, talked about multi-threading, I'm assuming you were talking about simultaneous multi-threading, so like having two logical threads per physical core, or am I misunderstanding that? Yes. I'm pretty sure the authors meant this, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'll give you guys some time to think about this point. I have the chat open in case anyone is typing something. YouTube as well. Um, I have just one question. I'm not sure if I understand correctly the Mirage core architecture. So basically, when you have the out of order uh, execution, and then you have the in, of, in order uh, engine, so basically, if I understand correctly, the out of order engine take the, the code and uh, schedule the schedule to the in order core the some uh, some work or is mm -hmm. it correct? Yeah. So basically, the, the out of order core it samples all of the applications and it runs uh, an application how it would do it as an out of order core and it saves the way it did it. So it saves okay. the program traces and. This trace then is saved in the schedule cache and the modified in order course, they just have their schedule cache, just like all the instructions that they have and just run it step by step in order. 
And because they are already reordered in an optimal way, the in-order cores without much more additional hardware, they can do a performance close to an out-of-order core. So that's basically the idea. Okay, I get you, so yeah. so you, you get the optimized code. Okay, thank you. No problem. Well, if this uh, if this can actually be implemented with lower energy cost, then obviously a massive field where this could be applicable is mobile devices. Yep. Or or maybe even or maybe even some extreme uh, edge cases where we currently have very ultra low power devices like uh, energy harvesting situations where we need absolute highs. Maybe I guess that's still a bit of far fetch just by energy consumption, but definitely mobile devices. Yeah, for sure. So mobile platforms, they're like very big factor. So like I said before, servers, they aren't the optimal candidate for Mirage course. So what's basically left are mobile platforms. And like one point I think about, it's like kind of futuristic. So you guys know like Iron Man, he has all his software, uh, all his hardware, he can talk to his uh, AIs and so on. So you can like use some of this like to get better mobile platforms and to use more like uh, heterogeneous in general. And another point with mobile platforms is so like Apple always releases every year like two or three different types of the same phone and you could save yourself a lot of work just by utilizing one arbitrator for each model. So you would have a green model, which is highly energy efficient. You have a performance module where it's only using the system throughput uh, arbitrator and so on. You get the idea. And I think another point is like energy efficient home computing. So this is not a thing nowadays, but I could imagine like in 10 years, uh, the way and with environmental problems, the way it changes, there could be limitations that are set upon chip designers. So they are told like your chip, it can only use this much power and so on. So yeah, like Intel is doing now by releasing a heterogeneous mainstream core, this could be like a necessity in the future. So, yeah. On another idea I just had, this this could be a dream for like a general uh, chips manufacturers. Yeah, aside from just the area cost, having smaller core means that if you have defects in a core, there are you can still have more. Like there is less of a chance that you have to disable it. And like if you have a defect in a big out of order core, like the entire yep. core is lost. But if you can replace that big out of order core with like four little out uh, little in order cores, and you have a defect there, then only one of those little in order cores is lost. So you could technically have like very very nice scaling on the in the binning process for these chips. Yeah, that's a nice idea. I haven't thought about it actually, but that's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, are there any other ideas? Yes, maybe another idea with, uh, I don't know, graphics computing or something like that, where you have a lot of parallel computing, I think. If you can scale the number of cores, then for application like graphics, it should be very good because it's quite always the same. So you could exploit this, um, this number of cores that can scale uh, a lot. Yeah, yes. so, yeah, sure. But uh, how would you change the, well, how can you use the Mirage core, like the way this? We'll look later how you can change it, but like the way it is now. Okay, yes, you... I need to think a bit about this. Okay. Okay, so we'll actually then move to the next point. So what needs to be changed to make it efficient for servers? So think about it. The problem right now is uh, servers, they have too much irregular fetch patterns. So it's hard to use the memoized code. I'll leave you guys some time.
maybe one possibility would be to um de uh, to get a to uh, generate a more safer um out of order reordering so for example if we have the out of order core like executes the instruction immediately or like let's say uh, executes the instruction immediately once the data is available um instead of placing it at that point in the in the ordering maybe delay it by like one or two instructions to give more time for maybe an irregular fe like a fetch that takes more time to then finish ex uh, to f to get the data so that there is less of a chance that the fetch that the fe that the randomness in the fetch pattern would cause a problem in the execution yeah uh lucas just typed in the chat kind of the same idea i guess so maybe queue less important server requests and process them in a regular pattern when enough of them arrive so basic idea of both uh, answers is like to well, how do you say it you kind of order it or kind of rank them to the importance or yeah kind of rank them uh, at the same time, how memorizable are they? Are they, right? Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of making the instruction uh, schedule, the instruction reordering safer, so that the, uh, so basically that we have a less of, like we we might sacrifice some uh, performance in short like in the short run, but I mean I'm not sure if it works. Uh, now that I think about it. Yeah, I think basically you just need to add more heterogeneity in general to make it efficient for servers. There are a lot of papers on this subject to make server workloads uh, more energy efficient and so on by using heterogeneity in general. So that's the point I made before in their Mirage core, they are very limited to CPU heterogeneity, where there is a lot of uh, space to develop uh, heterogeneity in general. So I think that's a big point. Are there any other points? If not, we'll move to the next discussion point. What needs to be changed to make it efficient for multi-threading? don't actually see why it wouldn't be uh, usable with SMT because as far as, at least as far as I know, and I'm not too like, knowledgeable about SMT, but isn't it just that, uh, that the same execution unit, like you have the doubled um, integer file, like the doubled register files, and you're just sharing the execution units? And if that's the only thing that's different, then like you double like, the, maybe the the caches and you have you should be fine right i'm like i'm not seeing the issue here yeah so basically what the author said as well so they aren't sure either and there is like a there is more work and more analysis needed to actually look at it so there isn't uh they don't really look that much at cache analysis and so on so it could be but uh, they don't know. And like, it's really unlucky they didn't do that on their own. Okay. Um... Uh, but isn't it like, also highly, co I mean, I, again, like I'm not too deep into it, but I'm pretty sure I've read some reports, at least from uh, AMD side. I think I read some people from AMD that uh, the SMT, SMT actually doesn't offer that much higher performance, especially on these um, in these 
more general purpose space that we would have in mobile phones or so where this would be very applicable uh, on servers where you have highly predict uh, where you have other access but and like i said not too into the, but on servers for example there are there is much more benefit to be taken from smt so i'm not sure how much of an effect it would even make to just not use smt at all yeah i guess it really depends on the platform that you would want to use it but yeah you're right it's a well it's a difficult question i guess if if it was easy they would have done it themselves okay um let's move to the next point uh, can the mirage core's problems be fixed by adding more heterogeneity in general And I'll actually I'll actually combine uh, combine this with the last discussion point. So, hardware accelerators that can be used, so that you guys might get some ideas. Okay, so like, since we are already past the time, uh, I guess if there are like no additional points or comments to the discussion, I guess I'm done with the presentation. Uh, thanks all for listening and participating in the discussion as well. Uh, thank you, Bernard. I, I will add a couple of points into the last uh, discussion point that you added here about okay. yep. accelerators uh, combined with uh, mirage cores, let's say, that you, you, you discussed in this paper. So I think that this is a kind of uh, nice direction, which it is already going on. If we look at the current chips, even that is produced by, by let's say, big manufacturers, like uh, you, you mentioned actually one of these recent Interproducers, I, I checked their their uh, uh, features. They they have kind of uh, uh, actually some some kind of accelerators for machine learning in their inside in, in their uh, uh, in their design. Also, yeah. if you look at other companies, they have they are producing a lot of uh, different type of accelerators next to the uh, uh, general purpose processor, different type of general purpose processor, basically in order of the order, etc. So, but but what the point that I want to emphasize here is the cost that we are going to pay. So, uh, so, uh, so, you, uh, so, how many accelerators we should add, and how how they should uh, interconnect together, or or to the other general purpose processors, how to deal with uh, somebody mentioned about the reliability issue. That was a nice issue. That, that was a nice point actually. So, how to deal with this reliability that that might be added when uh, when we adding more 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 components there. Or I don't know, because we have a limited area of the chip, right? So we cannot add a lot of accelerators, which they are like, uh, uh, they can do some special job perfectly, but they are not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, general, general, general purpose. So so, uh, so, so, in, so in this line, I would just add the, uh, uh, the cost. In, in addition to thinking how to add more heterogeneity to the mirror scores, I would also, uh, 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 at this point, that to think about the cost of this kind of more heterogeneity, more heterogeneous system on chip, let's call it, including general processor, processor as well as accelerators on chip, 
also uh, i think that this is this was uh, a big uh, debate in one of the talks that i was listening some time ago that what how the future chips will look like this they will be like a uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, accelerators on the chip or they will be uh, as as actually we are now discussing it will be like a mix of a lot of accelerators plus some general purpose processors yeah. but but of course there are a lot of issues that is still there so and i think that this is going to like uh, 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 not in like 10 years later, 20 years later. I think that now we are in the middle of uh, uh, that both industry and, uh, uh, and academia are actually trying to build something that is really optimized for, uh, for this kind of mixture that, that, that you pointed here out. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, yeah, I just wanted to give my comments about the last points and thanks again for, for your presentation and uh, for everyone for participation. If there is no... Uh, more comments to be added here. I think that we can get back to Mohammed and uh, see his comments. Thank you so much, Bernard and uh, Behzad. So do we have any question from the audience? I still don't see comments on YouTube. Okay, cool. That was very efficient. So we had uh, nice uh, presentations today. Thank you so much for Costa and Bernard and the, their mentors as well. Uh, so I will release the quiz right now. So yeah, please uh, don't forget to take it. We have still two weeks more to go. So all the best and uh, see you next week. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.